Good afternoon and welcome to today's presentation, Crop Injury. The information presented by the expert is not to be used as legal advice and does not indicate a working relationship with the expert. All materials obtained from this presentation are merely for educational purposes and should not be used in a court of law sans the expert's consent, i.e. a business relationship where she or he is hired for your particular case. In today's webinar, Dr. John Washington will discuss the meaning of crop damage, circumstances where crop damage occurs, applicable laws and regulations, industry standards, exploring evidence for causality, and case studies. Dr. John Washington is the principal consultant at Sarium Testing and a research and development director with a multinational agricultural technology company. John has more than 20 years of global experience in agriculture. He holds a PhD in plant pathology and an MS in entomology and has particular expertise in pesticides, crop production, agricultural pest management, conventional and organic agriculture, plantation agriculture, and crop injury legal cases. In addition to his experience in the U.S. agriculture industry, John has collaborate, collaborated with many global agricultural projects in Latin America, the Caribbean, Asia, and Western Africa. John is bilingual in English and Spanish. Attendees who require a passcode, the word for today is CROP. During the Q&A session, we ask that you enter this passcode into the Q&A widget for CLE reporting purposes. Q&A is located to the left of your screen. Please remember that if you are applying for CLE credit, you must log on to your computer as yourself and stay for the full 60 minutes. You are also required to complete the survey at the end of the program. Please note that CLE credit cannot be given to those watching together on a single computer. Tomorrow morning, we will send out an email with a link to the archived recording of the webinar. The slides can be downloaded from the resource list at the widget at the bottom of your screen. Thank you all for attending today, and John, the presentation is now turned over to you. Thank you, Lauren. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. I'm going to try to bring my experience in different um, crop damage liability cases over the years, giving a pretty broad swath of specific examples and giving you an idea about some of the patterns that these cases um, often follow. Um, I want to start out with this. Uh, I, I should also say that um, I really am trying to make this as interesting as possible and generate some discussion, so please, I'm uh, looking forward to your questions, um, anything that I didn't explain clearly, or things that you want to, me to uh, explain in more depth. I'd be very happy to do that. Um, I want to start out with this first slide and, and really making the point that crop production um, today as it always has been, is a risky enterprise. Um, many natural factors are against the person who endeavors to invest money, um, significant money in establishing a crop uh, prior to any cash flow, you know, having to wait for um, the outcome. Um, as you know, weather is one of the biggest threats, it not only disastrous weather, but um, non-ideal weather that can really uh, change the profitability of any particular crop season. And natural factors, um, diseases and pests uh, are as bad as they ever have been. Um, I will say that uh, um, today's farmer is really uh, having to employ all the technology available as well as navigate the very uh, detailed, often complex and confusing product labels, um, interactions uh, of different products, um, and regulatory environments, as well as the uh, coexistence with the public, which more and more, especially on a lot of specialty crops, um, there's always the dynamic of interaction with the neighbors uh, of a farm. Um, in some areas, that's particularly key and has resulted in the generation of some of these um, claims of uh, off-farm effects of farm practices. This photo here is actually banana, and that's a foliar disease called Cigatoka. Um, I was working for a multinational uh, banana company for uh, approximately a decade. 
in Central America. Um, and I want to bring this up, one, to illustrate the devastating effects of a disease. Um, many people, when they hear plant pathology, plant disease, they can't really comprehend what that is, and that's understandable. Um, but uh, this is one disease that can wipe out um, an entire plantation, if not more, uh, leading to severe economic losses um, really within a few weeks' time. And in this example, there are uh, there is the case where a multinational banana company is responsible for the disease control, the management of a disease, for member um, or grow, contracted growers, and when a company has the responsibility to manage a disease and for whatever reason fails to manage that disease, then economic injury can occur and subsequent claims of damage. So one example of a lack of management leading to, to major issues. Another big example that will help you, um, a lot of you understand plant disease today is, for example, citrus greening, a disease that's um, hit North America and f here in Florida has resulted in a 10% yield decline over the last five or six years, so really uh, threatening an entire industry and an entire region, um, a single plant disease caused by a bacteria. So diseases insects, um, and weather, uh, and other pests, <clears throat> excuse me, are a constant threat and have to be managed by anyone involved in growing a crop. Farming is a big business, um, a lot of capital required, um, outlays for fertilizer, chemicals, machinery, labor, um, all major issues and major economic um, drags on the business. The risk of damage, crop damage, um, really becomes critical in uh, the actual crop establishment phase where um, irrigation, um, fertility, or the use of fertilizers, um, pest control, those are human um, managed activities, uh, responsibilities with very big consequences. Um, and so this is where problems can occur when, when some of these things end up hitting uh, an activity economically, uh, claims can result. I, will, I do need to emphasize as well that once a crop is harvested, and I am including it in this presentation, um, there is also the post-harvest aspect where things can also go terribly wrong. Um, the whole logistical process of storage, um, proper storage, ideal for that specific um, produce, and transportation, um, the cold chain I'll talk a little bit about. Um, and then there are pests, diseases, and insects that also um, can occur at the storage and transportation state. So I have been involved in several cases of post-harvest damage. Yes, um, there does seem to be a lot of bias against chemistry these days. And unquestionably, farming is has a very, very big percentage of its processes involved with chemistry. Um, starting out with the plant itself, where um, the actual produce chemistry and, and all the physiological aspects, uh, biological aspects of that plant, um, its biochemistry, is often manipulated um, trying to gain advantage in uh, amount and quality. So there, I would say, um, in my opinion, the um, technology or sophistication of chemistry and agriculture is very, very high, um, including 
and not limited to the genetic manipulation, you know, transgenic crops, uh, GMOs, et cetera, which is really another subject, but also heavily involves really the chemistry produced by genes. Um, plant hormones are used uh, sometimes not very successfully, sometimes to the very wrong effect. Um, those are chemistries that can, at very low rates can alter the production of a crop. They are used. Soil chemistry has come up in several cases where we have to understand the soil type and chemistry. There's all kinds of reactions with applied chemistry, including fertilizers and crop protection compounds. Everything from the physical factors of soil, its drainage capacity, its ability to bind organic molecules of different types. Um, all these things can be, play a big role. The soil is really the medium, um, if you will, in which crop growth occurs um, and these chemistry interactions are occurring. So um, we do need to be very competent in this field and when, when we get involved in the details of exploring something that may have gone wrong. Um, everyone knows that fertilizers are a big part of agriculture. Um, even in organic agriculture, there are organic fertilizers. Um, fertilizers are much more complex than most people realize. Um, there's, there's a whole science behind this and, and not only providing necessary nutrients to a plant, but providing them in a ratio that will you know, maximize crop production, um, time crop production. Timing is so important these days in the marketplace, uh, missing key uh, market peaks for your crop and pricing can mean the difference between profit and loss. Um, crop protection and pesticides uh, still very big. Um, many of you have heard about the mergers of the biggest companies these days. There's really a, a few giants left, but there's also a lot of smaller and mid specialty type companies that have labeled um, pesticides, in many cases generic pesticides. All of these are covered by um, regulations that we'll talk about and labeling. I uh, mentioned plant hormones. Um, another group of chemis uh, chemicals that comes into play very often in um, crop injury cases are specialty chemicals called adjuvants. They do not have a direct um, toxic effect by themselves. They are used in addition to or with a crop protection or a crop applied chemical in order to increase the effect um, or the economy or give some other benefit to that applied chemistry. So adjuvants um, are often involved in, and have a role to play uh, in how a chemical and how a crop uh, protection practice can really um, behave. Post-harvest, again, the physio physiology and the, and the um, regulation of the specific content of the atmosphere where, where these crops are stored um, in many cases has a very big role to play in how, what is the shelf life, for example, um, of that produce so that it arrives um, at the wholesale or retail market um, in the proper condition, um, or big claims can occur there too. <clears throat> this is a picture of strawberry as grown in um, Florida, typical um, production scenario for strawberry raised beds under plastic. Um, these two center rows are um, where actually a, a demonstration trial, but it really shows you uh, what I'm showing you here is how soil pests, which are not visible to the naked eye, and we, we have to really study the soil with some precision and detail to understand what's going on, but these are 
um, what are called nematodes. They're microscopic uh, uh, roundworms who uh, feed off plant roots. And these two center rows were not treated with um, a soil fumigant, which is a, we'll talk a little bit in the next couple slides, but in other words, this is an untreated check. And it just shows you the natural state of the soil. Um, it makes it very hard to produce a crop without the use of crop protection chemistry or a soil fumigant in this case. You total loss, no production. Um, with the same expenses, so a big loss if it, if you did not manage this important group of pathogens called nematodes. There is also very frequently, actually, um, when a crop injury case um, claim um, is made, um, very often there are symptoms involved, right? Signs of the plant looking damaged, um, you know, not your um, expected healthy color either or shape. Um, the plant is wilting, the plant is yellowing, its spots are showing up, different symptoms according to um, what's actually going on. And it's this very... Uh, nature of things that, that, that can quickly confuse someone and make things um, complex. Um, symptoms are very often um, shared among different causes, different diseases, and even among abiotic factors like um, weather or um, chemistry uh, versus a nutrient deficiency as illustrated in these pictures. Um, nutrient deficiencies are when a specific element, um, a required element like manganese or magnesium or potassium is absent or, or at such a low level that it decreases plant growth and causes problems in the, the normal development of that plant. Um, these very same symptoms, you can show 10 different people uh, without giving them any context what they think is happening, and you might get 10 different answers. And this is where really the expertise of someone who's familiar with um, symptoms and can distinguish between um, different factors in, in terms of the cause of those symptoms. Is it disease? Is it, is it uh, nutrient deficiency? Is it a toxicity of an applied product. Those are things that uh, require not only examination, but oftentimes also experimentation, confirming and replicating, reproducing those same symptoms to dem clearly demonstrate um, what and what is not involved in any particular issue with a crop. Another example of a um, factor that has nothing to do with chemistry, it's a natural cause, it's a virus. Um, there are many plant viruses. Viruses attack every type of living organism, including plants, and there are many, many cases of absolutely devastating economic results and um, very big projects to um, manage or be resistant to plant viruses. These symptoms, again, can be present and complicate the diagnosis of any particular problem. And it needs to be mentioned also that um, almost always there are several factors involved when a crop injury case occurs. Um, they might not be related to that specific crop injury, but when you examine the crop and the patterns, there are probably several things that are not going right. That usually is the pattern that there's something going on. There's virus out there. There's disease. And one must be careful not to be muddled and lose focus on what the, the real claim contends. And one must uh, take all this into consideration and disregard what is really not pertinent to the, to the claim.
it is true that uh, chemical supply chain partners, including the manufacturer, the distributor, um, and the applicator, um, may be liable for crop loss or damage if the claim is uh, made against a chemical product and there is um, a misuse of that product. Um, and when I say misuse, I'm going to always refer to the label um, as well as industry standards, what, what is known about that. And I'll, I'll elaborate that more on what industry standards means in this context. Um, I will also elaborate on what the product, what the role of the product label is. But I, I guess perhaps the more famous uh, incidents of, cr of crop damage caused by a applied chemical is way back in the 80s with uh, benlate fungicide and contamination of the benlate fungicide batches with a very active herbicide. Traces, but biologically active in, the, in their own manufacturing facility. Um, this led to contaminated benlate fungicide uh, across, it's a, it was such a perfu uh, very um, common fungicide that uh, in many crops, greenhouse, open field, that there were many, many claims made, and that's probably the most infamous case. But on a smaller scale, I've per personally witnessed, you know, every year several cases of crop injury, uh, most not leading to claims, but, but this is something that's common. Growers are very aware of. Um, managers are aware of the issues and the potential risk of crop injury. So they're generally very careful about following the label and, and, and be, they do not, of course, want to, to do damage to the, to the crop. So using this chemistry properly, critical. I'll also say that um, on a positive note with, you know, going um, the, the trend over the last decades has really been a sophistication of chemistry. Cleaner chemistry, more specific, less broadly toxic, and more often than not, um, lower rates. The, the active, the activity as the research and development has become more sophisticated um, of this chemistry is active at much lower rates. So there's, you know, in the Final analysis, there are less pounds applied per acre, in, in many cases 10 to 100 times less than what was used, um, you know, even two or three decades ago. But this high level of activity also requires a very careful use because if you use too much uh, of a very active compound, you can really cause major problems, and this has come into play. Um, several cases that I've worked on. Application methods. Um, there are, this is really very critical area and has come in in the case of open field crop injury claims. The, the specific procedures and record keeping and application methods and mixing methods has come into play. These are questions that um, I will really dig into because I find very often that that um, the root cause of issues when it comes to um, bona fide crop injury damage from pesticides is usually a result of error in application. Um, could be timing, it could be adjuvants, could be rates, um, and also off target drift. We'll talk about that. But aerial application is a big deal. Um, again, I'll go back to my banana industry days where we had the largest operation of aerial spraying, even nighttime spraying. Um, uh, so the, all of the technology and um, specifics related to air applications are, are very well documented. The picture on the left is a ground spray boom 
um, one of the most common ways, um, but, but often also many compounds, including fertilizers, are injected directly into irrigation water um, as a convenient and economic delivery system right to where the root zone is. Uh, this is very common practice today. So all of these application practice methods have their specific um, procedures, pitfalls, and benefits, and it must usually be looked into very closely um, in these cases. So the more information we have about a case, the better. Injection into irrigation water. Um, this is a typical um, injection or irrigation station, um, well, pumps, um, and then water distribution systems throughout that field. Um, there are there is backflow prevention, so there's there's no risk of the applied pesticide getting back into the water source. It's, it's kept injected and only from that point forward. Um, particularly in the vegetable production in the United States, with the what they call plastic culture, you know, crops grown under plastic beds, um, soil covered by plastic. Injection and irrigation water of, of both fertilizers and pesticides is quite routine. Um, again, very well documented methods. Um, many labels with this type of, of uh, application procedure are out there. A very specialty application, which I actually involved in in my current job, is. Um, um, injection of volatile um, chemicals, um, specific chemistry that's uh, placed in the soil, not sprayed, but injected under the soil at a known depth, and then um, as a liquid. That liquid um, vaporizes, becomes a gas um, under plastic. This picture here shows the actual chemical injection. Another um, tractor follows this one, covering it with uh, polyethylene plastic, really holding that liquid and gas under the tarp, which does not escape through the tarp, um, and the gas penetrates the soil pores. Um, and if you remember that strawberry picture uh, where the two center rows are untreated, this, this is the type of treatment that's needed for uh, reliable strawberry production in most cases. <clears throat> Finally, uh, granular application, another method, uh, granular fertilizers, granular pesticides, um, another example, another type of application. I do want to mention um, Drift, um, I have been involved in several cases and am actually in, in involved in a case right now where off-target movement um, is claimed and off, the target is um, the crop and so we want, or, or a applicator wants to apply on that crop, does not want what he, what that person is applying to go outside of that crop. This is a, a um, Google Earth image of an area that I was working in uh, two years ago near um, Homestead, Florida, near Miami. Um, there's a uh, quick, should I say, there's a high population growth expansion of the city out into agricultural lands, and um, they're seeing a lot of um, issues and interactions with growers and neighbors, uh, you know, almost inevitable effect of populations bearing very close to fields. And this is one area, not the only scenario, but one type of uh, scenario where neighbors may perceive issues and conflicts may come up. But drift management um, needs to be, it's often on product labels if they're vulnerable to damage to off-site targets, so very important subject. And I want to just mention that in the United States, there's a um, spray drift task force, an industry-wide task force that has quantified 
methods and um, mathematical predictive models um, for spray drift off-site movement according to wind, which is clearly the, the major factor, application type, and all these technical details that can influence um, if a spray moves off target. So when there is a um, claim or a conflict um, alleging off-target movement damage by crop applied chemistry, um, spray drift needs to be assessed. What, what were the procedures in place? What were the conditions, precise conditions at the time of application? Do they, do they support a claim of off-site movement? Um, do things are uh, available? There are public information, there's scientific information out there, so they can be navigated quite successfully to determine the role of spray drift. So um, the way I've looked at crop damage, like many other fields, uh, you know, claims and in conflicts is, is it's a detective um, type uh, activity. You really you need to get as much information as you can, and knowing what questions to ask are important. Knowing the industry standards and how things are generally done, and how growers have to manage a multitude of different uh, factors, is that insight allows one to ask the good questions and getting to the root cause of assessing um, damage. Um, it's, it's, it's straightforward that way. It's, it, it's really about having the insight about what questions to ask and, and what can go wrong, what typically does go wrong um, as, like anything else, looking for patterns. I've been involved in several cases where just clarifying that really solves a dispute. Um, when you can come up with evidence in, in a very logical uh, establishment of, of events, um, solving that mystery often results in either the case being dropped or being settled, and, that, and that's happened in a majority of the cases actually I've been involved with. So I would like to stop there um, for any questions at this time. We'll take a little pause um, before continuing with the second half. Now we are entering the Q&A. Please remember that if you are applying for CLE credit, you must attend for the full 60 minutes of the presentation. Enter the passcode in the Q&A during this time. The passcode is CROP. You may also enter any questions that you have for John. Um, the first question that we have is with the increase in technology, can you speak to the future relevancy of the farming industry? Meaning, do you see food products being produced in a lab and not in a field? Excellent question. Um, I'll give you one example that's maybe not so extreme, but it kind of illustrates what your premise of your question is. Uh, there's a major strawberry marketer that's present um, multinationally and are now looking to, well, they're doing the research now for a couple years looking at what they call tabletop production. In other words, taking it out of the field soil, um, strawberry production, and um, putting it in um, shade house uh, raised platforms in artificial medium, like a, a coconut medium. Um, the economics of that clearly is challenging, but there also are savings on labor, uh, higher productivity, more controlled environment. So yes, um, in all industries, I think growers are constantly looking for a better way. I, I, if there's one thing I could, someone asked me what is the most common quality of a farmer, I would say always looking for a better way, never satisfied with the current stat, status quo, looking to you know, beat the market, looking to produce more cheaply, how do they solve their labor problems, how can they grow a better crop, get better buyers, yield and quality. So, yeah. Um, but I do not see, just in terms of 
the logistics of dependably serving mega distributors like Walmart, which is really the dominant force today, um, you know, they require consistency, absolute timeliness. If you fail on one order, you can lose their business forever. I've seen that. And the field production is uh, economical. Um, there is an anti, I would say, agriculture environment generally in the U.S. today, so that, that presents its challenges. And there is a export from places like California, agriculture now going more to Mexico because of regulatory and public pressures. So, yes, there are some important regional trends, but I do not foresee anything really um, – making such a huge impact that farm growing would disappear or become diminished in a significant way. More like market niches. Okay, next question. Have you had any experience where a pesticide was mislabeled and caused damage to a crop, but label limited damages to the purchase price of the product? In your experience, has any case held that damages were limited to the purchase price of the product? No, the purchase price of the product, although often mentioned, hasn't come in to be a, a, a major factor. Um, there have – I have come across um, a, several times claims made of crop injury because of, of off-label – well, because of the, the product itself. Um, and in both cases, it turned out that the label of that product uh, clearly stated – um, that certain practices were to be avoided and those practices were not avoided. So that points to the label being really critical, um, and that's why manufacturers and producers spend a lot of time on labels, covering their risk and, and absolutely identifying potential problems, uh, hopefully before they occur, and then putting that on their label. How does increasing heat interact with crop injury claims? Increasing heat. Heat is a, can be a stress factor, certainly. I've seen many interactions over my life with um, where heat has been a contributing factor to crop injury claim. So there is a relationship, and it really comes down to the physiology of that plant. Um, plants, can, not surprisingly, can resist damage better if they are not stressed by heat, lack of water, too much water, etc. Thank you for answering those questions. You can continue on with your presentation. Okay. Um, I want to bring a, just a, a briefly a case in my own company where um, grafted watermelons are um, being produced and sold. Um, grafting is uh, joining um, a top portion of the plant or um, a scion on a bottom portion of the plant, which is called the rootstock. And the reason this is done is it confers some advantage. In this case, it confers resistance to a soil-borne disease in watermelon and therefore um, avoids the use of having to treat that, that soil chemically. It provides a resistance so that that crop can grow in the presence of that disease and not be harmed. And there was a case um, across several customers where um, uh, a certain percentage of these plants were, ended up being stunted. Um, very serious. And I just want to emphasize here that there were 10 different hypotheses or hypotheses or reasons why um, people thought this was occurring with, you know, different pests and um, one thought it was herbicides and another thought it was irrigation and everyone had their reasons to think about, you know, why um, they thought this was happening. And just by looking directly at the you know at the plants that tells you a lot what what causes this specific 
um, appearance of the plant. Where is that damage actually sourced at within that plant? Okay, and um, one of the central principles that I use, and I think this is really a scientific standard, but that really applies to to many other things. When you have a causality, a claim of causality, right? This factor is causing this problem. When you're trying to determine that, if you find something that's that's plausible, let's say an insect um, outbreaks, but that factor, those insect outbreaks, are not 100% consistent with where you see that problem. Well, that really does rule it out. If, if it's not consistent related, then you have to rule that out. There must be something else involved. It could be a contributory factor, but you know that that would be very good evidence that it's not the factor causing it. And I ran up against that specific scenario in this case. It turns out it was an actual graft union incompatibility. That that plants were not those plants were not grafting properly, so they would basically reach a point in time where they would not grow anymore. Um, it was whereas the prevailing the hypothesis out there was that it was pest related. So again, just looking at the details and, and everything has to be logical. Everything has to make sense and causal uh, effects on causality have to be very strong and very consistent. So we already did our question and answer. I will continue to the next slide. I will make a very strong advocacy statement for experimentation. I mean, demonstrations are very, very powerful. I've used these in several cases. Um, if Yes, you know, the counter argument is we cannot exactly replicate what happened in X field. But if we can do it often enough or increase the severity of the risk, for example, if a um, claim is made that X fertilizer caused damage to X crop, well, okay, I would, I would definitely want to use the soils from that field. I would want to do the test in that field if possible um, during the same time of year, so we might have to wait a year. Um, but on a, on a preliminary scale, we can also do greenhouse tests. We can take samples of that soil and do pot tests to get you know some preliminary indications. Um, and to make the scenario um, higher risk, I would take that fertilizer and double the rate and triple the rate and five times the rate. Um, really challenging in trying to show that causality effect. Well, if I apply this fertilizer exactly the way they did at the exact same rate in the same soil with the same seed, okay, the temperature and the weather is going to be a little different, but I should see something similar. If I don't see anything, well, what if I do it at double the rate and triple the rate? And if I still see nothing, now that really is telling, telling me that this fertilizer was not involved. Um, and, and this is uh, also has to do with transparency. You know, methods um, and the scientific method is meant to be replicated by anyone. Um, clearly established method, so it doesn't depend on one person. It, it's a method that can be tested by anybody. In agriculture, um, so often and in much of my work is about demonstrating, demonstrating to farmers, um, demonstrating to regulatory authorities, demonstrating to um, the company uh, executives you know, what a product does, what it doesn't do, what are its limits. So. <clears throat> Having someone who's very accustomed to testing and asking questions and gathering data can be really valuable in a legal claim um, because these questions can be answered and can be tested and are tested um, really in many, many scenarios. So replication um, of the of the circumstances surrounding a claim can be very powerful. I've seen it be very effective in many, many cases. Laws and liability. So there's a 
very popular saying in the agricultural world that the the product label is the law. The label is the law. And how is this label generated? Well, um, in the case of crop pesticides, um, they have to go through a whole gamut of tests and data, toxicology being primary, um, you know, what toxicity, what is the toxicology of a chemistry on different animal groups, including um, extrapolation to humans, you know, is there, do they cause cancer, do they cause, you know, are they involved in uh, other aspects of toxicity? And then the efficacy, how is it used, what rates, can it be used with other products, what's the timing? The labels are very crop specific, very, very specific details on how to use this chemistry. The more risk that a chemistry has, um, the more regulated it is, the more complicated that label is going to be, the more expensive it will be to produce that data. Generally, for background information, for a new crop protection chemistry, um, it's going to be at least 10 years, several million dollars generate all the required data, um, and these laws and regulations do vary um, outside of the United States, but they are generally not more lax, counter to um, public perception. Foreign countries are often even more strict. They, they have um, general anti-chemistry bent these days, so getting stuff registered is a big, um, big activity, and product labels are really at the center of that. Um, the, the burden of correct use falls on the user. They, they need to file that label. Um, they need to read that label. I will tell you from a real-world perspective that, yes, growers do read the labels, and they ask a lot of questions. They, they are growers that have been successful, that are in business, are very – they can't be risk-averse because they take risk every time they plant a crop, but they do want to know the risk and they want to avoid unnecessary risk. So they do read the label. They might not read it every time they use the product, but they will definitely review that label and come at you with lots of questions on, on new products. They do discuss among themselves, among trade industries and meetings, university extension is at the center of this. So crop labels, not only a regulatory requirement, but they're also really the the centerpiece format for understanding how to use a specific product. So every case where something comes up, we need, and it's very easy, these are on the web, um, free, available, all, any label can be Googled um, specific to the manufacturer. These labels can be attained in PDF format, and, and that's the first thing I do when I, I'm involved in a case that involves crop chemistry, I want the label understand what the directions for use are. There are, um, let's see, as far as post-harvest, um, now we're talking about really contracted services. Um, for example, a garlic exporter from China um, contracts a cold storage facility in Miami so that upon the importation of that garlic um, into the United States through the Port of Miami, very specific um, agreement. Hopefully that contract is clear, what temperature is required, how long, very specific instructions um, for which that garlic exporter is paying the cold, uh, um, cold house uh, provider in Miami, for example. So those are more of a contractual and not a label. Labels are detailed. Um, they really um, go, what is the chemical makeup? What are the other components? There are what are called inerts. Not all inerts are necessarily identified. They're, they, they may be proprietary. Um, but if there is a issue, um, a claim about the toxicity, often um, these inerts will be brought into the discussion. Um, uh, 
of course, with anything else, it's that fine print. I mean, this is just one page of a 10-page label. But these details are extremely important. In addition to use directions, um, something that comes up very often is mixing compatibilities. Um, in all of the cases I've had dealing with a claim against a crop chemical, the mixing procedures um, are brought into play. Um, have they been tested? Is it on the label that you can mix this compound with another? Did you do preliminary tests about these mixtures? Is the mixture stable? Is it, is it maintaining a uniformity of mixing or does it separate out? Is there a chemical reaction occurring in your mixed tank? How long was that mixed tank sitting before you applied it? All these things can come into play. Clearly rate the rate per acre. Just like in human pharmacology, the toxicity is rated to how much um, was consumed. In this case, how much was applied? Was it applied correctly? Was lots of confusion um, on a broadcast area versus an actual crop acreage, a row acreage? That comes into play many times. The timing, many labels um, prohibit the use of that product after a certain stage in that crop or before a certain stage. Um, also, this can have to do with crop residues which are regulated. Um, uh, there is a defined amount of residue permitted or not permitted with each of these chemicals and so the proximity to harvest has come into play when issues about pesticide residues have have uh, been involved in claims. That is another source of claims is having uh, produce rejected because of chemical residues that are not permitted uh, on that. Been involved in several of those cases. Re all kinds of restrictions, um, the, the pr proximity to a school, a hospital, the proximity to a well, um, there are restrictions, for example, in Miami-Dade County in Florida because of the soil type, very vulnerable to groundwater contamination. So any chemical that has a propensity um, to infiltrate groundwater is not allowed in that particular county. Um, in California is another great example of restrictions, um, township caps and putting limits on total amounts of chemistry allowed to be applied in one season um, in any given township. All these are spelled out in the labels. Um, the one factor that comes into play a lot is crop rotation. Um, crop rotation is the sequence of crops. So in the southeast, for example, of the U.S., you know, often peanuts are, are alternated in the same year with cucumbers, for example. Um, more of the fall, uh, winter, spring cucumber production and, and summer peanuts. Well, there are many herbicides which are often involved in cases like this that are very active at very low rates and are persistent uh, in the soil. And so there is a restriction for example, cucumbers are very vulnerable to the herbicides that are used uh, on other crops like peanuts. And so there's actually a restriction on several uh, herbicides where if you use this herbicide, you cannot plant cucumbers for 18 months. So I was involved in a recent case where that came into play and basically the grower did not respect that label. Um, and was blaming uh, something else, but in reality, it was likely a residual herbicide. So the labels, although we can generalize, we need to have that specific label and, and know exactly what is recommended for that product on that crop. Um, just another example of directions for use. Um, these are very detailed and, and how mixing orders, uh, et cetera. And these are, I've worked in the agricultural industry and have developed labels, so all of these really um, are in response to 
a tremendous amount of in-house research that occurs in the development of these products. Um, and when problems are um, observed, uh, phytotoxicity or crop damage, um, these are certainly factored in to the label and to use instructions, and all these things are vetted out because clearly uh, any manufacturer or distributor does not want to have claims against their product. It, it, the word gets out, um, a product can really be destroyed uh, if there are too many issues going on in its sale and use, and this, of course, has to be avoided. Um, okay, now, uh, there are also many times where specific agreements are in place um, beyond um, or in addition to labels, um, regulations, um, there are just simply agreements. Um, several um, organic uh, cases where things have gone wrong, so uh, I just want to make clear that just because a production of a crop is organic does not mean that it's without risks. To the contrary, often greater risk, um, even more management, um, and many other uh, factors involved that can also be subjects of liability and claims. There are many certification programs out there <clears throat> today in different industries and in different um, produce groups. Um, Rainforest Alliance is one of them. For example, um, a lot of uh, most of the bananas imported into our country are under this certification, and that really goes speaks to environmental management down in the production areas. The whole ISO um, certification programs are quite common. Um, the um, Specifications on produce, on the quality and types of um, produce that are produced often also come into play. Um, again, cold chain and post-harvest damage are um, need to be uh, very well managed um, or major issues can occur. Industry standards, this is, uh, in the U.S., this is very strong and very transparent in agriculture, um, starting out with, you know, our historical government agencies who have um, produced a lot of the original research and technology in agriculture. Now that has shifted more to private enterprises and grower groups, but the government uh, agencies are still involved. And universities are generally very strong in, in every state in the U.S., so the extension programs and extensionists and specialists, um, researchers who are specialized in um, diseases or herbicides or different aspects are um, very much uh, involved with the industry um, in these different crops. And so there is a uh, plenitude of published articles and um, trade journals and seminars and web-based uh, materials um, on all of these crops and most all of these problems that have shown up. I've always um, utilized uh, publicly available information, consulted with experts, extensionists in that region, you know, have, and they have seen um, many of these things over a longer time period in any given area than, 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 than one person not from there. So their perspective is extremely valuable and, and provides a lot of insight into what could be going on or what likely was, in, was involved in any crop injury claim. Um, Certifications, uh, again, all these are, uh, as I would say agriculture is a very, very high regulated industry, and this results in a lot of public, um, publicly available information and documentation. And in terms of 
claims and conflicts, this information uh, is very valuable into resolving disputes. Excuse me, John, we are reaching the end of our time, so if you could possibly wrap up your presentation, and we have a few more questions. Sure. So superb record keeping, um, like so many other industries, that's essential. I will say that growers, by and large, are very good record keepers because they have been um, burned, so to speak, by not having good records. So they, they generally are good record keepers. Um, case studies, I've mentioned a lot of these briefly in reference to my talk. Um, so I think I'll just leave these in the interest of time and go right to your questions. Finish up, thank you. Okay, thank you. Please enter the passcode during this time. The passcode is CROP. You may also enter any more questions that you have for John. Our first question is where does the anti-agriculture sentiment come from? Oh, good question. I think generally its root cause is the fear and lack of understanding of chemistry. Um, it's also because of real historical problems and abuses, you know, just going back to Rachel Carson, of course, a monumental work, DDT, post-World War um, chemistry. But and with all sincerity, I will say that that the, the public perception has not kept up with the advances in technology, advances in knowledge, better regulation. Um, I'll, call, I'll, I'll, I'll make an analogy to the airline industry where every accident leads to thorough investigation and, and uh, efforts to make sure that doesn't happen again. I think agriculture has also followed that trend over the last couple of decades. So we have a very drastically different and safer scenario, but the public is still not, um, by and large, understanding that. Next question, have you ever investigated crop damage in a certified organic crop? Um, I have, not in relation to a injury claim, but on the relation just I, in my time with the multinational um, banana company, we had a very, very big organic banana production in Peru, and there were some major production issues, so I, yes, I have and several different cases just been involved with diagnosing issues on organic crops. Last question, what do you believe is the future of interior farming? Uh, it has a niche and just like organic farming, it's not going to take over the world, but it's, it's, it's a market niche. It's important. It's very significant. Um, I particularly see it in um, urban environments with very strong markets and in foreign countries. It has a lot of advantages. Um, it has a lot of disadvantages, but it, it will continue to grow, to be strong, um, but it will not, in my opinion, you know, be the dominant production scenario. Thank you for answering those questions. In addition to being your best source for testifying and consulting experts for the past 60 years, TASA also offers e-discovery and forensic solutions, free interactive webinars, day in the life videos, research reports on expert witnesses such as Challenge History Report 2.0 and Expert Profile 360. I want to take this opportunity to thank everyone for attending and most especially John Washington for his time and effort in creating this presentation. If you would like to speak with John or if you would like to speak with a TASA representative regarding an expert witness for a case that you are working on, please contact TASA 1-800-523-2319. One of my colleagues will be following up with you regarding your feedback on today's presentation. This concludes our program for today.